gap year before going off to college, I worked as a nanny, taking care of a three-year-old whirlwind of a child. And he kept me busy. And while a lot of it was hard, frustrating, and frankly, unglamorous, the tantrums, the cries over spilled ice cream on the pavement, the daily treasure hunt of diving for Cheez-Its stuck in the couch cushions, and the struggle to get him dressed every morning in the outfit only he insisted on wearing. What I did love were the flashes, the glimpses, the moments of seeing the world the way a child sees, of getting to encounter life from a fresh, new perspective. And one day, hand in hand with this little child, we walked to a local field so he could run around and play. Sitting on the grass and watching him, I noticed he'd picked up for the first time a dandelion. And as he ran towards me with the flower in hand to show it to me, the white, angel feather-like tiny seeds flew one by one into the wind and all around him. And he stopped in his tracks and turned to me. His eyes opened wide and said, wow, wow, look, look, it's beautiful, it's everywhere. And he couldn't get enough. Running back to the patch of dandelions, he pulled out from the earth fistfuls of them, as many as his little hands could hold, and with abandon and amazement, blew on them, watching the seeds dance in the wind, delighting in how they slipped through his fingers and into the air, here and there and everywhere, all at once. Everywhere, all at once. That's where we are in the story of Acts. We find ourselves right on the heels of Pentecost, when the followers of Jesus were filled to the brim with awe, that inescapable beauty of the Holy Spirit, so much so that those who saw them thought that they were crazy people, drunk people. But they were drunk on wonder, on the magnificence and goodness of the Lord, and that strange and wonderful beauty that could not be contained it was contagious. It was everywhere. Nearly 3,000, scripture says, were saved by this infection of the Holy Spirit, their lives different, radically altered, profoundly changed. And it's in the immediate afterglow of this event that these new believers are propelled by the Holy Spirit, fervent in their devotion to live out an authentic, Christian communal life. They were committed to, the text says, they devoted themselves to sharing this outpouring of what they had experienced to make it tangible and real for others. And so they did everything together. They ate together, broke bread together, prayed together, read and listened to scripture together, and hung out in the temple together. All who believed, scripture says, were together and had all things in common. No one lacked the essentials. There was a sense of mutuality, of complete sharing and open-handedness. Instead of a mindset of possessiveness and scarcity, there was a tangible reality of abundance with enough love and goods to go around. Well, maybe to you this sounds like some hippie nonsense. You may have some questions like, Emily, is this kind of community and intimacy realistic? Are you going to preach on Christian socialism or what? Because that sounds cute and nice and all but I don't really think it's possible because that was 2,000 years ago. That was then. 
God's presence must have been easy to feel in those early days. A vision of everybody getting along and sharing in this radical way. It's too rosy for me to buy into. It feels too distant, like a long gone utopian fantasy. A grown up faith wouldn't believe in something that idealistic. And I hear you. All of this togetherness, this vision of community, it sounds like a lot. It can feel overwhelming and impossible, a vision too perfect to live up to. But the word perfection isn't used in the text. Just think about it. Take a moment to imagine the biblical scene in your mind's eye. 3,000 mouths to feed, to clothe, with more being added to their number by the day. Can you envision that commotion and all of that running around? Picture the temple, a mob of believers, all assembled and pressed together tightly, like a can of sardines, everyone truly up in each other's business. The loud shouts of praise and worship ringing in the ears of all assembled, a divine, unsettling racket, and you better believe that some people were annoyingly off key. <laughs> Once strangers, now strangers no more, bonded together by their mutual love of Christ, coming with handfuls of coins and throwing them to the feet of the poor with abandon, having sold all they had on Craigslist or whatever the ancient equivalent was, and crumbs, the crumbs maddeningly everywhere, on the temple floor, in the mutual breaking of bread. I mean, who's going to sweep that up? Never mind the smell of so many bodies together, everywhere, all in that one place. It sounds that turns beautiful and electric and alive, but also, perhaps, deeply chaotic, verging on unsustainable, and maybe even dangerous uncomfortable, risky. So maybe that's what you get on the wind of this story. A smell, a whiff, a hint of the stink of community, that possibility of failure that must have been hovering over the scene. A sense maybe you sometimes smell in the story of your own life and experience and relationship. It's true. Community isn't always roses. In fact, it can often reek of disappointment and thanklessness. Maybe in your relationships, you've been deeply hurt. Maybe you are bitter and feel others aren't giving as much as they should. Resentful others aren't fully buying into the vision of church in the way you think. Maybe church has been the most hurtful place of all to you when you've risked being vulnerable and have been burned by others. Or maybe you're just plain exhausted, actually burned out with all this intimacy required of church life. You've given so much in community that you're tired, jaded, just going through the motions, breathless, and exhausted and feeling alone. The roar, the wind of the spirit, maybe for you now feels like a whisper, a whimper. It's enough to want to yell, doesn't anybody see my deep hunger, my loneliness, my need to be seen and known and recognized? Do my acts of care and giving count? And God never said in the text that this early church stuff, this church community, was perfect or easy. But God knew that we still desperately needed each other to care and to give to one another, despite our shortcomings and the tendency to hurt and to wound. He knew it in the garden in Genesis when he said, it is not good that man should be alone I will make for him a helper. We need to be each other's helpers. 
It's how God wired us, called us to be. Relationship and community were a part of God's design from the very start. And that same breath of God that filled us with life at the beginning of creation, that divine second wind that rushed through us at Pentecost, full of the promise of rebirth and newness, we can experience that renewal right now, today. Radical, spirit-filled Christian community, it's not just a pipe dream, a fantasy. It can happen. In fact, striving for that dream together is what a life of faith is all about. But friends, it does take us, all of us, deeply knowing and remembering what kind of people we are. Why, are, why we're doing this thing that we showed up today. We are Holy Spirit people. We are Easter resurrection people. Amen? Amen. So let us remember that awe of when we first became baby Christians, to drink from that well of wonder, to hold fast to the moments in which we've had faith and experienced that sweetness of communion and community. For the truth is, if we are not rooted in the Holy Spirit and don't make that the substance in which we live and move and have our being, we will not get too far. If we try and run on our own energy, we will only run ourselves and our community into the ground. We will pour from an empty cup. So let's reconnect to the Holy Spirit and remember that we are a people of possibility and renewal, and that the Holy Spirit is the stuff, the source, and the glue of our relationships. For it's God who, as Psalm 23 says, restores our soul and his spirit, it will feed us and set a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies, in the messiness of this life together. It's through his power that our cup overflows. So I challenge you to maybe take a moment in prayer to open your hands and eyes wide this week, to reconnect with that childlike wonder, to see God's beauty and provision everywhere. Because the Holy Spirit, it's all around us, friends. And if we give out of that wonder, it will sustain us, and it will sustain all of those around us. Only then can we gladly delight in watching all we have slip out of our fingers and into our neighbor's hands, knowing that there is always more to be had from God. For in God, there is no scarcity, but only abundance. And maybe, just maybe, in the giving, we might see the glimmerings of the Holy Spirit in our midst, stopping us in our tracks and causing us to say, wow, 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 look, it's beautiful, it's everywhere. Amen.